Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the UC Riverside School of Public Policy's annual policy debate. My name is Divya Bharadwaj, and I'm a Dean's Ambassador for the School of Public Policy. I'm honored to serve as the MC and moderator for today's event. Today's debate topic revolves around the intersection of artificial intelligence, algorithms, and existing works of art. The question we will explore is, should the government create new laws and regulations to limit the use of existing works of art by AI algorithms? During the first hour of this debate, two UCR students will present arguments on opposing sides of the topic. Following the debate, we will have a brief audience Q&A session for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. We are privileged to have as our distinguished <coughs> guest judge, Dr. Mark Long, the new dean of the UCR School of Public Policy. He started his time at UCR just this past January, and we are so excited to have him with us today. <laughs> at the conclusion of this debate, Dean Long will provide his remarks and render a decision on which side has prevailed. We appreciate your presence, Dean Long, and thank you for being with us today. Now, without further ado, let's introduce our student debaters. On the pro side, we have Rachel Strassman. Rachel, please approach the stage. Rachel is a public policy student and works as a public affairs student assistant for the School of Public Policy. She is dedicated to studying and advocating for policies that address societal challenges and promote social justice. <laughs> Next up, on the con side, we have Cooper Pru. Cooper, please approach the stage. Cooper is a mechanical engineering student and currently serves as the Chief of Staff for the Associated Students of UCR Office of the President. He is passionate about the intersection of technology and policy and hopes to contribute to innovative solutions in the field. Please join me in welcoming our debaters. Now on to our debate. Our Ambassador Kelly Durr will be serving as timekeeper throughout the evening. The pro side will go first. Rachel, you have eight minutes. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Divya. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Strassman, and today I will be arguing why the government should create new laws and regulations to limit the use of existing works of art by AI algorithms. First, let's start off with a brief explanation of how we get from original human art to unjust AI art. As many artists have been doing now for decades, an artist will create an original piece of art and then upload it online, whether to share it with the art community, fostering creativity and helping inspire others, or to post it online to their store as a means of supporting themselves and their families. Enter AI, which trains off billions of images from vast corners of the internet, which in and of itself isn't technically illegal, in fact, two years ago, the Supreme Court in Google v. Oracle found that using data from Java as e-code to create a new operating system was indeed fair use. But they only used portions of the code, and it was used to create a completely different product. In our case, though, after the AI is trained, companies sell rights to reproduce original images and images in the style of the artist. First. Let's take a look at fair use. Fair use was designed to encourage artistic expression by allowing for the use of protected works without the original creator's permission. Fair use as it is requires four main components, three of which we will talk about today. First, the purpose of the use, such as whether it is for nonprofit, which is often permissible, or commercial for sale or profit, which is often not. This also includes whether the new work adds something new with a further purpose or different character and does not substitute for the original use of the work. This is known as transformative and is a key component of fair use. In this case, companies are training their AI off artists' works and then selling the ability to use their text-to-image AI. These users can then input into the text to create images in the style of certain artists foregoing the traditional and just method of hiring artists to create art in, their, art in their specific and developed styles. Beyond the illegal commercial use, these AIs aren't nearly transformative enough, allowing users to prompt the machine to produce images, as I previously said, in the style of certain artists, which not only substitutes for the original use of the work, 
but also does not have a further purpose or different character. The next consideration is the substantiality of the work utilized. The more work used, the less permissible. And there are also less protections given to those that are copying the most important or defining part of a work, commonly known as the heart of the work. In this case, it was the entirety of the work. It is also important to note that the closer the focus is to the defining part of the work, the less permissible it is. Thus, when you copy an artist's style, the defining characteristic of their work, as these AIs do, it is no longer considered fair use. Finally, the effect on the future potential market or the value of original work is taken into consideration, and if either of these are harmed, it is not permissible. It is clearly evident that as a result of AI art generation, the current art market will be desecrated, with artists' works losing significant amounts of value as people turn to AI to commission works in the style of these artists. Looking back, the purpose is for profit. The work being considered represents not only the defining part, but also the entirety of the body of work. And the effect on the potential future market and value of the original work are catastrophic. To put it simply, it would be naive to think that AI has been engaging in fair use. Which brings up an important point. What were the original intentions of copyright law? Well, they were to promote the progress of both science and art. Copyright law in its most basic form is an acknowledgement that all art owes something to that which came before it, designed to promote innovation and creativity. If we allow the progress of science to stifle that of art, it would be going against the very text in our constitution. Thus, we need to find a way to protect art and science, protecting artists while still allowing technology to advance. Looking to the past, when technology advanced faster than copyright law could keep up with, the music industry took a big hit. It seemed like musicians wouldn't be able to receive the compensation they deserved for their hard work, with released and unreleased song MP3s being widely and illegally distributed on platforms such as Napster. This completely cut off musicians from compensation, and if a new licensing model hadn't been created, music creativity would have come to a halt. Today, the music industry in America alone is valued at $26.2 billion and growing. What happened to the music industry in the 2000s shows us that the same can happen with art and AI. Complex licensing models are attainable. And not only are they attainable, they are also ethical. Some companies have already achieved this, specifically Getty Images and Nvidia Picasso, who built two generative AI models to make responsible AI in which revenue generated from the models will provide royalties to content creators. Although this is one company amidst a plethora of unjust ones, and this design doesn't address all of the issues, namely how they will ensure that AI outputs don't substitute the original images, it is most definitely a step in the right direction and a sign that new and ethical licensing models are attainable. To conclude, AI is an ever-growing field. The time to act is now, before it gets too out of hand, and then before we know it, artists will no longer have the incentive to be creative, and AI will be too far, making it difficult to ensure the necessary protections and precautions are in place. Not to mention, fair use cases are often intensive and tedious, and are very often to get appealed over and over again. Laying a framework for AI that ensures protections for art as well as technology, along with clearly defined points, will allow for creativity to continue and technology to prosper. AI is on track to reshape economies. It can't be underestimated, nor can it be taken lightly. And finally, a full understanding of AI has not yet been achieved. We need to bring stakeholders and experts together to come up with legislation that protects, supports, and reflects the intricacies and necessities of both industries. Thank you. Thank you, ProSide. At this point, I will now give five minutes to the con side to pose questions to the ProSide. <coughs> Cooper, you may begin asking. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, so the first question I'd like to ask is regarding any new regulations or restrictions that may be put into place. Um, how can we make sure that these regulations are future-proof um, and that they won't be impacting anyone negatively in the future? Um, and how can we make sure that they're constantly being adapted to meet the rapid advancements in this technology? 
Yeah, so that's a great point, and thank you for bringing that up. <coughs> and I think that that question exactly represents the problem with our copyright law as it is. That it was made in a different time for a different set of art and work and everything, and we need to create new regulation that not only reflects our current times, but also adapts to the changing times. And as I said previously, that would require <coughs> artists, um, people who work with AI, people who focus on technology, and a bunch of people to come to the table because public policy is interdisciplinary and we need to have all those voices together so that we can create laws that protect copyright and protect art. Thank you. Uh, in your argument, uh, you talk about how AI uh, blurs the boundary between human-generated art and art that is generated by the intelligent from large databases. Um, but I do want to bring to the point that uh, it is true that for many decades, centuries, millennia, uh, humans have actually drawn their inspiration from many different places, whether it be a mountain they see in the distance, something they see in passing. Inspiration must always come from somewhere. So I want to ask, why should AI-generated art be treated differently in this regard? Yes, yeah, so that's also a good point. And a common misconception about AI is that they're being inspired to create these images. But in fact, if we actually look at the recent Supreme Court case involving, um, involving Andy Warhol Foundation v. Goldsmith, um, it considered the legality of selling an illustration that was based on a previous image. And Justice Sotomayor wrote that an important factor to consider is whether the copying work comes with a competing commercial purpose, which AI does. Companies like Dream Studio are selling out tokens to produce up to thousands of images, depending on how much money they put forward, where people can create images in the style of certain artists foregoing their income and having a competing commercial purpose. So unlike drawing inspiration from the mountains, the mountain's not going to sue you because the mountain's not making money anymore. These people are going to be losing their money because of this and losing their livelihood as well. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to ask, um, if we impose additional restrictions um, on what types of data the AI algorithms are allowed to use and not allowed to use, uh, will this not be stifling significant innovation in how the data is able to be training artificial intelligent algorithms, and this could, potential, could, could potentially lead to uh, downsides and in other innovations for AI technology as well. When we stifle the data set for this, um, it could limit how we're able to train the technology as a whole. So how can we make sure that other sectors won't be affected by placing these restrictions, especially because we don't know how far these restrictions are going to be able to go? Yeah, so these restrictions are exactly, would be for that point. Because at the moment, the way it's taking its track, AI is being valued more than art. And we need to create a licensing model that allows for AI to be valued as well as art in harmony. And so in order to do this, you know, there's not even a full understanding of AI. We need to get people who are experts in the field to come together with lawmakers to create something that works for artists and people who work with AI. Thank you. And just one last question. Uh, in your argument, we talk about the uh, economic value of original artworks and how that's affected by the mass creation of AI artwork. Um, I do want to point out that AI-generated art is an entirely new wave of art, such as the photograph was uh, a century ago. Um, and how can we go ahead and justify restricting AI art in this sense, um, in the fact that it is attracting new audiences when compared to some other revolutionary technology that came out in the past? Yeah, so like I said previously with the mountain, taking a photograph of something doesn't take away from the money it was already making to begin with. And it comes to the point that it's allowing for technology to advance at the cost and the expense of the original artists themselves. And yes, we should have a world in which AI can create art and we can inspire this new generation of people to be interested in art, but it needs to be done in a way that doesn't affect or catastrophically harm the people who started it to begin with and whose data is being used to create these things and to profit off of. Thank you, everyone. Now on to the con side presentation. Cooper, you may now present your case. Just like with the pro side, you have eight minutes. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So today I stand before you to discuss this rather important and thought-provoking topic of how AI and artificially generated art um, is an issue in today's society. 
Um, so the use of artificial intelligent algorithms in generating new works of art is highly controversial right now. Specifically, we are going to be examining whether the government should or should not create new laws and regulations to limit the use of existing works of art by AI algorithms. Specifically, this means controlling the data set that these algorithms have permission to use, not whether the algorithms exist in the first place or not. While this is a complex issue with many valid concerns, I firmly believe that imposing such restrictions would be counterproductive to artistic innovation, freedom of expression, and the advancement of our culture. Instead, I think we should embrace AI-generated art as a catalyst for creativity, collaboration, and cultural enrichment. I'd like to say that existing copyright laws already do exist, and although they've had their issues in the past, they do adequately address many infringement concerns that do happen, and adapting them moving forward is a much better approach to this rapidly evolving technology, rather than simply totally restricting the data sets that these technologies are allowed to use. First and foremost, the question is, do we need to place more restrictions on the works created by AI, or should we evolve our existing laws to fit the needs of our future? Um, the first important thing to note is that AI algorithms are a huge new technology. This technology is groundbreaking, and there's absolutely no precedent set for how to deal with a technology of this scale. Uh, this technology is already allowing the potential for huge artistic innovation uh, by combining existing elements in unique ways from all around the world. These algorithms analyze and learn from vast data sets consisting of various artworks and allowing them to create entirely new pieces that push the boundaries of creativity worldwide. By leveraging the power of artificial intelligence, artists can explore new artistic territories, experiment with new styles, and challenge the traditional norms that have been around for centuries. This capacity for innovation should be celebrated and encouraged because it adds riches and diversity to our cultural landscape. The question is, do all AI algorithms steal artwork? And to bluntly put it, the answer is no. Supporters of restrictions argue that AI algorithms steal existing works under the guise that they violate copyright fair use. However, it's important to recognize that fair use provisions exist precisely to promote creativity and transformative works and the advancement of knowledge as a whole. AI algorithms do not merely copy and reproduce <coughs> original works, rather they reinterpret and recombine elements to produce something that is new and distinct. In the recently released Supreme Court decision on the case of Andy Warhol uh, versus the Visual Arts, sorry, versus Goldsmith, uh, there was an issue regarding the licensing of a silkscreen uh, silk work done by Andy Warhol uh, that was based on a picture taken by Goldsmith. This is a very interesting case that's very pertinent to, to this debate, and I want to bring up the dissent that was expressed in that debate itself. So in this case, the dissent, uh, which was two justices, stated that it doesn't matter that the silk screen and the photo do not share the same set of characteristics. And I'd like to emphasize that this is not only relevant to just this uh, legal case, but it's also relevant to many issues in this field. Whatever two items you're comparing, if they don't have the same aesthetic value and they don't convey the same meaning, meaning or intentional purpose behind it, uh, we can draw conclusions from that. It does not matter that because of those dissimilarities, the magazine publisher, so that was uh, the, the debate here in this case, um, did not view one as a substitute for another, basically meaning that if these two works are supplemental for one another, if you have two pieces of art and one can replace another, that is the determining factor of whether it is violating fair use or not. Uh, the justices in this case particularly argued that because the art was used for commercial purposes, um, it, was, uh, not, it was in fact violating fair use law. However, I want to note that this is extremely different from the original view that was expressed in the 2019 case when Warhol first was brought into court uh, in, the in, in New York. It was brought to the jurisdiction of New York. Um, and there is an entirely different argument presented here. Um, the dissent goes on in this case stating, why do we have fair use anyways? And this is something that I'd like to talk about that's very important. Why does the United States even have fair use policies? Um, we have fair use because it, while, while copyright encourages the making of creative works, as Rachel stated earlier, and it promotes their public availability, it does not allow people to utilize them for specific things such as news sources, etc. And it's very important for us as a nation to protect that right. Beyond promoting availability, fair use itself advances creativity in the field and artistic progress. And this is because, as we know, creative work doesn't happen in a vacuum. There's no such thing as an art piece that's been created without inspiration from somewhere. The concept of fair use 
encompasses the transformative nature of art, and the existing artworks used as training data for AI-generated art falls within the fair use boundaries. Artistic expression is a fundamental human right that is protected by legal frameworks across the world, especially in the United States of America. By limiting the use of existing works of art by AI algorithms, we are going to risk impeding on this freedom of expression by both the developers of these programs and the users. By analyzing existing works of art, AI algorithms can use these to offer new perspectives and new aesthetics in the art field and new artistic experiences for people in general. We can see new pieces that are created in museums worldwide. We can already look online and see thousands of new things that have been created. Developers are now using AI to create movies, which are basically thousands of pictures. And these are utilized as tools. Just as human artists use existing works for inspiration, uh, AI does the exact same thing. We don't place restrictions on artists in terms of what paintbrushes they can buy. We don't place restrictions on what type of canvas they can use or what tools they use to create their art pieces. So placing restrictions on this specific tool of artificially generated art is not inherently okay or acceptable. Rather than limiting AI's access to existing works, rather we should embrace its use as a tool and encourage it and promote it and worry about the repercussions of copyright with copyright laws that we already have in place. While ethical considerations must be addressed, creating new laws and regulations is not the most effective approach. Industry-wide ethical guidelines and best practices can be developed, and they're already working on being developed by collaboration through the artists themselves, AI developers, legal experts, relevant stakeholders, and much more. Creating guidelines much better fosters the responsibility of the developers of the artificial intelligence, as well as the values that we hold true in our society. By having an open conversation about what type of uh, development should be made and what should be acceptable or not is much better than completely limiting and restricting what data sets can be used by this technology. We need to focus on striking the right balance between regulation and innovation instead of working on directly shutting down access to the data that this technology uses in total. Current copyright laws are effective. Although legal battles can take a long time, they are very effective in making sure that the right case stakeholder or the proper person is awarded their fair usage to the product. Adapting these current laws to fit the ever-evolving technology is a much better solution than completely limiting its access to data sets entirely in general. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper. At this point, I will now give five minutes to the pro side to pose questions to the con side. Rachel, you may begin asking us. Thank you so much. All right, my first point is actually going to be about this last slide here. You say that current copyright laws are protecting works collected in training data. So what do you have to say in response to dozens of artists that are currently in the process of um, suing uh, AI models for taking their images as training data? Some people who have found their personal private medical images used as training data and seeing those to... Um, switch out their services as artists? Of course, thank you. Uh, this is something I really want to focus on is there is a huge inherent difference between the maker of the AI program and then the user. When a maker creates an AI program, they're, they're, they create a program, usually with good intent, hopefully with good intent, and that's there to develop, foster creativity, and advance our society. It is up to the user to determine what data set is applied to that technology. So you can feed it a data set of five images off a flash drive, or you can feed it a data set of the entire internet if you give it access to being online. When you feed it that data set and that you give it access to all of that material, that is perfectly acceptable when the user is going to use it for their own purposes. When the user, specifically the user and not the program, decides to then use it for malicious intent, that's where it becomes a problem. This is the common question that's asked through all kinds of arguments in our society of, what do we do? Do we restrict the technology or do we restrict the user? Because oftentimes the technology can be used for malfeasance and damage, but the user is the person who ultimately determines whether it's used for good or bad. So I'm responding to this by saying it's important to make sure that we're litigating the users of it who are using it maliciously and not restricting the technology as a whole. And then, so in response of that, do you think that the government should favor the growth of technology over the livelihood of artists? Absolutely not. I believe that in the United States, one of our founding principles is the pursuit of happiness. 
Um, if you are an artist and you find that happiness is through art and that you want to make your living in this country by pursuing an artistic career, that is perfectly acceptable. Uh, the purpose of the government regulations are specifically to make sure that people are safe and make sure that people are protected. And that is the purpose of copyright law in general. And the counter to that is that we also do have fair use policy. So fair use policy does allow for specific people to utilize already existing works, content, whatever it may be, uh, to whether comment on it, change it, or transform it. Um, and by going ahead and limiting the entire data sets or limiting what people are allowed to use or not, uh, you are inherently creating a situation where they no longer have the freedom to decide what they want to do with this technology or not. Um, so although there may be specific instances where individuals don't get the ruling that they want in a specific court case, the laws do already exist to defend them and that's why they exist there in the first place. Because the law is, it's, although it may not always work out the way that specific artists might want, the law is already in existence. We can go into the whole question of whether the law regarding copyright should be modified or amended, but that is a whole other conversation. Um, but the laws <coughs> do already exist to protect them. So if you're saying that the laws already exist to protect them, and you're quoting cases that haven't been won, and cases that have been overturned and dissents in Supreme Court cases that were not the ruling opinion, how do you, uh, do you expect to use existing laws if your support for these existing laws is cases that were not won in favor of your argument? Well, the definition of copyright law is, uh, the whole purpose of copyright is to promote the creation of new work and not to monopolize existing works. <coughs> so right now, whenever copyright is uh, implemented or it's used in a court case, uh, it's usually to the extent of someone using it commercially. We just talked about how different works can be used for nonprofit uses and lots of other circumstances like that. Um, and if they are used for different things like that, it is perfectly acceptable. It comes down again to the person using it, the person in the chair. Is the person driving the car that kills 100 people the one at fault, or should we ban the cars, right? With this technology, because it's so profound and so unprecedented, we have no current regulations in place for how to restrict it or how to regulate it. It's, it's just unprecedented. So it's unfair to go ahead and put a whole stop to it, especially when comparing to how other countries and other nations may not be putting a full stop on this development in general. Um, so it is important to note that if we do restrict these data sets, it will limit our ability to develop. Um, and that we can't do that at any cost, and that the entire point of copyright law is to make sure that people do have the right to create new content, and that it's specifically in regards to being able to not monopolize something that someone else has already created. Great. Thank you, everyone. At this time, we will now move on to the pro side's rebuttal speech. This will be the pro side's opportunity to refute the opposing side. Rachel, you have seven minutes starting now. Thank you so much. <coughs> Anyone to get back? Oh. Sorry, give us one moment. All right, so I would like to start off with a quote from an MIT Futures of Entertainment conference. And at that conference, they had a panel called Rethinking Copyright. And in their program, it said, it is becoming painfully clear that the current conception of copyright is ill-prepared for regulating and making sense of a world where media content is fluidly circulated by most of a society. Take a moment for that to set in. Now let me tell you that this quote was from 10 years ago. Our copyright system wasn't ready then, and it's not ready now. Which brings me to this point. Earlier this year in January, AI researchers from Google, DeepMind, Berkeley, Princeton, and ETH Zurich conducted a study on data sets, and they discovered that when evaluating the data set, there is a chance that diffusion models will store information that make it possible to recreate something like an image in its training data, provided that the image in question is used appropriately. So that being said, I know that the con side was bringing up the fact that it's not the company's fault, it's the users, but the companies have been creating these models that allow for the reproduction of images, as you can see here. And there are more examples. These are just a few of the thousands of images that they found that were replicated from input into output in their research. And so if these can be replicated from input into output, the companies themselves are allowing for people to reproduce images that are unjustly not theirs and that are hindering the effect of artists 
to create their own images and make their own compensation. In fact, MIT Technology Review reported that Google, Meta, OpenAI, and DeepMind admitted that all the companies admitted that data protection is an ongoing issue and there are no perfect solutions to mitigate harms and that the risks and limitations of these models are not yet understood. So if companies are putting out models that aren't fully understood, where their priority is to get the AI to produce the desired outcome, not to know how it does it, then they're setting themselves up for situations in which they're harming artists and their work and their livelihoods as well. This also brings to light another important instance <coughs> in which someone who used AI art noticed that her private medical images were found in data sets. And in response to her specific case, the CEO of Stability AI, Imato Stock, said that, they has, that he has found con confidential out data in output, and many of his colleagues have too. And if they're reproducing images from output and they're reproducing confidential data from output, uh, from input into these outputs, <coughs> how can we say that these models are safe to use and that these models are promoting creativity? When in reality, all they're doing is promoting copying, which goes against the laws of copyright. I would like to also refer back to the Andy Warhol case that was discussed earlier. The conclusion they came to was that Goldsmith's original photograph of Prince and Warhol's copying of that photograph in an image licensed to a special edition magazine devoted to Prince share substantially the same purpose and the use is of commercial nature. So you can see that the images vary ever so slightly, but they're not nearly transformative enough and beyond the lack of transformativeness, they are hindering on the original image's ability to create profits. In fact, Sotomayor did not dispute that Warhol's work was slightly transformative, but that he paid to license these photos for his artistic renditions. And these licenses are how photographers like Goldsmith make a living. So if we take the original creator of the work and we scrap their ability to continue to make a living and instead promote something else, it is not constitutional, as the Supreme Court has argued recently, and it is not consistent with laws. So we need to create laws that will make it more clear, make it easier to understand, and will make it so that we can protect both art and AI. And that we can allow creativity to prosper in a new way. With, when you let AI to do this, you're letting AI to provide an economic incentive to not create original works, which is the goal of copyright. I would like to end with a final note that the renowned physicist Stephen Hawking said about AI that if a superior alien civilization sent us a message saying, we'll arrive in a few decades, would we just say, okay, call us when you get here? We'll leave the lights on? Probably not, but this is more or less what's happening with AI. He warned that the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of human, the human race. We need to work now to create laws and regulations to ensure the protections are in place so that both <coughs> industries can develop and both industries can flourish. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Rachel. Now I would like to give the Kansai an opportunity to give their rebuttal speech. Cooper, you now have seven minutes starting now. Thank you so much. So I'd like to address the concerns raised by the pro side regarding the use of AI algorithms in generating new works of art and specifically the need for restrictions on those data sets, because that's what we're talking about. While the pro side argues for the implementation of new regulations, I firmly believe that if we implement those, um, that will not only restrict creative freedom and not only restrict the ability for developers to create what they want to create, which could have intensive good purposes in the end, but it is also going to be affected uh, by the fact that we are creating new laws and new regulations on a topic that we do not fully understand. We do not understand how powerful AI is yet. It is a brand new technology. 10 years ago, if you were to say artificial intelligence, that would sound like something out of a space movie. It doesn't, it's not a technology that's been around or been developed to this extent until extremely recently, specifically in the last three years. 
The pro side expresses concerns about AI algorithms potentially indiscriminately using copyrighted works without proper attribution or permission, and therefore undermining the rights of these artists and creators. However, it's important to recognize that these issues can already be addressed by existing copyright laws, and that they can be used by AR under fair use policy. In the pro side, they mentioned that confidential data is often contained sometimes in the output of AI-generated art. These are very specific circumstances where you have to ask, where did that data come from? AI cannot generate data about a certain individual without receiving it from somewhere. It can't just take guesses about confidential information about a person. It has to generate that from somewhere. So at some point, there was an input into that set that was put in by a user with likely malicious intent. That input by that user is the problem. You can't just restrict the input across the entire nation or the entire world in general. Rather, we need to make sure that users are prosecuted when they input malicious data intentionally. In the case of Warhol that we just talked about, the Supreme Court did rule that it's not, that it, in fact, that uh, basically copyright was infringed upon. However, I want to note that even in the statement put out by all seven justices who agreed on the conclusion, they mentioned that it is not strictly up to the court to determine what level something is transformed to or how transformative something is. That is not a decision that's left up to the courts. Rather, they are trying to set a precedent of whether to allow or disallow all of this altogether. That is a precedent that is very dangerous moving forward and needs to be addressed accordingly. You cannot quantify something like this with a simple yes or no question. This is a huge, vast issue that spans far beyond just art. Uh, data sets for artificial intelligence is used in lots of different fields, but specifically here in art, it is the core fundamental for what this art is generated with. So if you restrict large portions of it altogether, you're going to be restricting something that could have a huge potential in the future. Uh, another concern that the pro raised during their argument is that AI-generated art oftentimes closely resembles existing artworks that are already copyrighted. However, we need to understand that AI algorithms go far beyond just reproduction. They have the capacity to combine existing elements that are already out there in unique and unexpected ways that have never been seen before. And this can result in distinct artistic creations that we've never seen. By updating copyright laws to account for these transformative uses and explaining how transformative use is used in AI because this is an ever-evolving technology, we can strike a balance that does protect both the rights of artists while encouraging innovation and artistic exploration. Furthermore, the pro side argues that restrictions should be implemented to prevent the generalization of art and overshadowing of innovative art ideas uh, from original artists um, by algorithms that rely on popular and, un and recognized elements. So if we feed data to an algorithm that is recognizable, there's a risk that something can come out that is also recognizable. Once again, if the final end user decides to use this and publish it publicly, that is the fault of the end user. That is the person who is taking this content that is obviously copyrighted and publishing it out there. If they are the ones who are doing that, they are the ones that should be prosecuted and not the data set, nor the developer, nor the algorithm. In terms of economic concerns, the pro side suggests that AI-generated art can flood the market, devaluing nice pieces and potentially devaluing works that have already existed for a long time. Um, however, we need to consider that there are broader benefits to AI-generated art, such as its ability to attract entirely new audiences and broaden the artistic field in general. Once again, this is a new technology. This is comparable to the creation of the video camera. If we would have placed restrictions on what you are allowed to record with a video camera right off the bat, there would have been no precedent for what can and cannot be recorded to this day. If we do the same thing for AI technology, it risks our ability to advance this technology in general, not only just for us, but around the world. We have other countries in this world that are constantly developing this tall technology, and they're feeding with unlimited data sets from the entire internet. Some countries are even feeding data sets of their national intelligence to artificial intelligence to create new plans, new ideas, um, and there is malfeasance used for these purposes. Although this is specifically regarding art, we cannot limit the fact that if we are going to control data sets fed to art intelligence, there is also the risk that it can be restricting other intelligences in the future. Artificial intelligence, as you guys know, is currently being used to develop me medical practices, um, solutions to problems, infrastructure problems. It's currently being used by the DMV to regulate traffic control. And all of that data that's being fed to it 
which oftentimes as images is very useful and core to the purpose of that intelligent. If we restrict it for art, there's no telling how far that that restriction might go in restricting other technologies from using it as well. In conclusion, copyright laws that already exist can effectively address any infringement concerns associated with AI-generated art. By adapting these laws to specifically the artificial intelligence digital landscape, we can protect the rights of both artists and creators. Imposing additional restrictions on these algorithms would stifle artistic expression, hinder technological progress on a world scale, and limit the potential of AI-generated art as a tool for new artists. Rather, we should embrace this opportunity to update and refine our legal framework in regards to copyright and fair use policies, and accommodate the digital age and strike a balance that respects both the rights of artists and the creative expression and transformative process used by artificially generated artwork. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper. We will now move on to five minutes of open questions. Both teams now have the opportunity to take turns asking. Thank you. So in your presentation, you said that what's happening currently with AI and art is unprecedented. So, and your solution to that is to use existing laws. Do you then recommend that when faced with challenges, the government should just sit and wait for desecration of an industry before creating laws, instead of working together and trying to understand and create regulations that help all industries prosper? No, I do not disagree with that. However, we need to be careful when we say that something will allow all industries to prosper. Uh, in this specific case, if we go ahead and inhibit what AI can use, we risk something called stymies innovation, basically the entire hindrance of a process to continue and to grow. If we limit this process, like I said earlier, it's limiting what we can use it for in the future, what it can be used for in other aspects, medical industry, technology, etc., and it puts us to behind on a world stage. Um, if we go ahead and implement laws radically with a knee-jerk reaction, this is like we just got hit with this situation where artificially intelligent art is flooding the market, and we just react to it by flooding the market or flooding the legislature with new laws trying to restrict what data it can use, uh, that's not going to be a very adequate way to address the situation. Unless we carefully comprehend and take the time to figure out how to approach this problem correctly, we risk creating laws that are actually going to damage and hurt the ability of AI in general instead of promoting it as a technology. Before you ask another question, in response to that, these laws wouldn't just be created very quickly and without consideration. The whole point is to fully gauge an understanding of both systems so that while we're waiting for it to get developed and for AI to get to a point where we can feel confident about making the most comprehensive laws ever, that we're not allowing artists' lives to be ruined and the art industry to be desecrated as we're waiting for the proper time for AI. We need to start making these changes and looking for solutions now before negative effects become catastrophic. But go ahead and ask another question. Thank you. When we talk about uh, the economic value of these artworks, there's oftentimes there's, there are being models developed where you can create an artwork using artificial intelligence, and then the artists who are attributed to it are noted to the creator, and then they can be fairly recognized and compensated for that artwork. Uh, people who created the initial artwork, and then it's reutilized by artificial intelligence and creation, will be accredited if that potential legal system is in place. So what's wrong with the legal system that would attribute that compensation and economic benefit to the artists rather than just limiting the data set entirely? Well, for starters, that would be the anomaly example, but that doesn't address the main point of the issue is that economically, it's not taking into consideration the fact that even if you make credit, sorry, even if you make credit an artist for having that original use which inspired the output, that's still gonna be affecting their work, and that's still gonna be affecting their personal market, in fact, probably even more so now that they know, oh, for $5 versus 500, I can, using AI, produce an image in the style of this artist that I love that's taken years of time to develop their specific style, and then I can go ahead and make it so that they don't have any income, they don't have any compensation, and AI generate it, but their name is off to the side. Well, to respond to that, the first thing to note is that people do have an inherent value of art. art. Art is very subjective. 
as we all know. Whether art is good or bad, there is no clear way to define this. So if someone decides to value a piece of AI work over the actual artist, that is up to their discretion. You can't go ahead and say that AI work is bad because it's new. I mean, I'm sure that's what people used to say about the camera when it was invented. How many, how many portrait artists were put out of work and fired when the camera was invented? Because now you can get your headshot taken. Um, by implementing like guidelines that can protect artists and making sure that people are held responsible for paying their royalties and making sure that people are protected with their original works under copyright law, that is a very fair approach to punishing people who use this maliciously. But if anything, if we just restrict what people can feed into this data or what data people can feed into the artificial intelligence, you're limiting everything else that can be created. It's hindering our progress and it's creating the situation where you are determining for individuals what art is good or not. You're saying, oh, you're not allowed to like AI art because it's new and it may be using someone else's art as a reference. You're telling people what they can and can't like rather than allowing them that creative freedom and allowing them to choose what they would like to like. Do we have time or no? Five seconds. Okay. All right, that is all the time we have for open questions. Pro side, you now have four minutes to give concluding remarks. Thank you so much. So earlier today, the con side said that it's not up to the court to, to determine what is transformative, and it's a complicated line to cross. I agree that it is a difficult line to determine in cases like these, and in that case, we would need to create new laws to make it easier to understand what is considered transformative and not. The con side said that recording with a video camera is comparable when it is not, because when someone records a video camera of a chair, for example, that chair, after that video is produced and published and sold, is not gonna lose value. That chair is not gonna lose profit, but these artists will. And using the, uh, the car example that the con side used, the cars were designed to be safe. They were designed to work as they should. These AI models were designed in ways that produce outputs, or produce inputs in outputs. The car manufacturer did not make a car that was meant for the brakes to wear down. They were meant for the brakes to be effective. Going back to my original slides, Fair use requires that there must be no effect on the potential future market or the value of the original work. At the end of the day, we can argue about transformative and we can debate about that, but it doesn't change the fact that the future market will be desecrated. Yes, there might be a slight expansion in terms of AI, but it doesn't make up for the fact that artists who originally made these images that created these AI data sets are not getting compensated for their work. The con side of the argument supports perpetuating the interests of mindless technology at the expense of creative human minds, their will to create and their livelihoods. To put it simply, current laws weren't written to contemplate a world in which the artist was a wall of servers that trained on five billion works and could produce new ones without effort in seconds. Something that inherently has a destabilizing effect on the market that no single artist studying and working could ever have. I agree that this is unprecedented, which is why we need to bring artists, we need to bring people who are experts in technology to the table to create laws, create regulations that support the development of both AI and art and don't result in cases like these where we're seeing inputs replicated in outputs, where we're seeing artists works being duplicated when users are allowed to create works in the style of that artist, where they're gonna forego purchasing from the artist who spends hours and hours making a work, not to mention many, many years at times to develop their specific style, and now they're losing all of their income, all of their livelihood, all for a machine and a couple servers and a bunch of data. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Con side, you now have four minutes to give concluding remarks. Thank you so much. So the pro side refers to this as a mindless technology. I want to emphasize that that is exactly what this is. AI is a mindless technology that is a tool. It doesn't think for itself. It doesn't tell itself what to do. A person tells it what to do. And that person is responsible if they use it for malfeasance. It is a tool that can be used by any individual, and how it's used is up to the person, and they should be prosecuted accordingly. 
The pro side argues that the future markets will change. It absolutely will. Markets are always changing. What people like, what people don't like, what people want to purchase, what they don't want to purchase, that is continually evolving all around the world every single day. Right now, the, the most commonly selling car last year was the Tesla, at least in California. Uh, five years ago, it certainly was not. I believe it was the Honda Prius. These things are constantly changing. What people want to buy are constantly changing because preferences change as time goes on. I stand firm in my belief that if we do impose these new restrictions on artificially intelligent <coughs> algorithms in the realm of art, it will be unnecessary and counterproductive to the art culture as a whole. Existing copyright laws, coupled with development and comprehensive ethical guidelines, do provide a <coughs> solid framework for addressing concerns related to this infringement, um, especially when it comes to consent from the artists, compensation for the artists, and giving credit to the artists, assuming that a proper structure is created. If we adapt these existing copyright laws to move in this direction, we can effectively safeguard, or safeguard the rights of these artists and these creators. By allowing AI algorithms access to diverse data sets, we do promote innovation, we promote cross-pollination of ideas, and the exploration of entirely new art forms and styles. AI-generated art has the potential to serve as a catalyst for creativity, it can inspire artists to, to delve into uncharted territories, and it enables the fusion of human ingenuity and the capability of these machines. Restricting access to data sets would just hinder this potential for artistic growth, and it would stifle the collaborative nature of AI-generated art. Rather than focusing solely on restrictions, we should prioritize the development of comprehensive ethical guidelines that address these concerns, rather than stifling the technology as a whole. Furthermore, AI-generated art provides opportunities for cultural preservation and restoration. One important thing to note is that AI is currently being used to restore old artworks. Artworks that are being destroyed and going away, AI can be utilized to recreate what they used to look like aged 1,000, 2,000 years ago, and put these into history books and put them for people to see on the internet, on the market. Restricting access to data sets limits for potentials like these and other developments in the field of AI and how it can actually benefit the art community as a whole. We must also consider the broader benefits of AI-generated art. AI art attracts entirely new audiences to the world of art, it fosters cultural enrichment, and it broadens the entire artistic landscape. This is a whole new field of art that no one has seen before, and there are people who appreciate it. We cannot undermine that appreciation by those people simply because we are scared that this technology might be infringing on other artists. Because if comprehensive guidelines are established, we can stifle that concern entirely. That's not something that needs to be concerned. Adapting existing copyright laws and exploring innovative ideas on how to address these issues is much better than cutting it off entirely. I believe that we can strike a balance between protection of artist rights and progress in technology, and that we can ensure that the realm of art continues to thrive in the digital age, no matter how it moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper, and thank you to our students for a great debate. <laughs> From here, we are going to transition into an audience Q&A. You may pose your questions to either side. Someone be British. <laughs> Absolutely. It comes down to the entire principle of how do these algorithms actually <coughs> work. They take large data sets, and the more data sets they have, the more diverse the creation can be. It takes specific styles of different artists, it takes specific styles of pictures, the way things are created, and it takes all that information to generate something entirely new. Um, if it generates something that looks similar to a piece of art that's already on the market, then it's the user's fault if they decide to repurpose that and use it for commercial purposes. But in general, when that <laughs> art is created, it might be inspired by different artists or inspired by the way something looks, but it isn't directly copying it. Everyone's inspired by something. All art has to be inspired from somewhere. So AI is simply drawing its inspiration from pieces of art that already exist, and that's not something that we should be looking at.
sort of question for the comment. <coughs> um, you mentioned that it's like the user who's cho choosing what the AI is generating, but don't you think that there's something to be said about the fact that the AI software itself has not, like as <coughs> the pro side mentioned, has not been taught to sufficiently make sure that the, that the generated photo is going to have that difference, and as such, shouldn't you at least before you're going through with all of these like thoughts, make sure that's resolved before you can go forward with the copyright laws. Sure. So this is a great opportunity to express the difference between the program itself and the data set. So this whole topic that we're talking about here is simply should we restrict the data set that the program is utilizing. But artificial intelligence in general is simply just a program that uses some data, whether it's a little bit of data, you know, pictures from your phone or the whole internet, and it uses that data to create something. If you guys are familiar with large language models, those are entirely different than this. However, they're taking text from the internet, or at least an archive of the internet, and generating responses. In AI art, uh, tools commonly take that from pictures, and then they will generate something new from the picture. So if we go ahead and completely restrict what that software, what the program is able to access, you are restricting so many things that can be created from it. Um, there probably should be regulations on what developers are allowed to develop and how they're allowed to create the program. That is something that I don't think anyone disagrees on. But what we're talking about here today specifically is what data should be allowed to be fed to the program itself and not the actual nature of the program itself. Um, this is a question for Cooper again. Um, but, so you mentioned <laughs> the video camera um, like analogy that you were making. Um, how that was a comparable, and I understand that you know with such groundbreaking technology such as this, it's like, it's needed to kind of reference back to similar events in history to kind of figure out how we dealt with that, right? And I'd like to say, I feel like a more comparable thing is to compare that video camera um, to, like, so right now AI art takes in input or a data set of all these images, and it's, you, you can even see that on the screen, and then sometimes it will create an, all, like an almost facsimile, or the fact that the input contains those images can, like, you know, raise concern, right? So the video camera, it, it would be like not be, like recording or like taking a picture of the mountains or anything like that, it would be like, taking a picture of an already existing piece of art, for example, like recording a Netflix show, right? Or like, you know, taking a picture of um, like a piece of art and then selling that, right? And that is like pretty much clean cut piracy, right? So w with that like comparison, would you say that, you know, perhaps the video camera is not the perfect like analogy to use for that? Although no analogy is perfect, I still think the video camera analogy stands perfectly because once again, it's up to the person, the maker versus the user, right? The person who made the camera created an invention that's used Probably it's one of the biggest use event inventions of all time around the world. But the user of that camera is deciding to use it for uh, poor intended purposes. They're deciding to use it to steal an artist's work, to steal something that someone else created and then profit off of it for themselves. And that's why we have copyright laws to punish people who do that. In this specific topic right here, um, what we're talking about is if we go ahead and restrict what this program's allowed to receive, you're going to restrict it in a way that's uncontrollable and we don't know what sort of externalities are going to affect it in the future. Um, right now, uh, with AI, it's a tool just like a camera, and I use a camera example because when the camera was created, that changed the way the world worked. People no longer needed to get portraits painted. Uh, when buildings were being constructed, you could take a picture of it and send it across the nation in a matter of days rather than having to have a portrait drawn and send it to people. Uh, back before cameras, people didn't know what world leaders looked like around the world. You just knew the name from the newspaper. But once the camera was invented, that was now possible. And so with the invention of a camera, which was so revolutionary, we are looking at something that is just as, if not more revolutionary than the invention of the camera itself. So with something this big, our whole point is that we shouldn't be reacting quickly and we should be carefully developing how we're going to proceed, what guidelines to put in place, but we should not hinder the actual development of the camera, or in this case, the actual algorithm in itself, because that can affect the program in the long run. If I may in interject, because all the questions have been posed, um, and to make sure that both sides are being heard. Um, with Going off of that question with the camera analogy, as I previously mentioned in my argument, at the end of the day, a camera taking a picture of a mountain won't hinder that mountain's economic ability to profit. But an AI utilizing artist images 
will hinder their economic ability to profit and their livelihoods. If there's a picture of a mountain, more people will visit it, more people will care about it. In fact, if anything, you can argue that the camera will only benefit the mountain. But in terms of AI and in these instances, AI will only hinder artists unless there are appropriate legislations put into place to ensure that both industries can thrive simultaneously. Um, I have a question for the pro side. So you say that there needs to be restrictions and there needs to be legislation. Where do you see that legislation taking effect? Like what would it look like? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that brings me back to the Getty Images example that I previously discussed. Getty Images partnered with NVIDIA Picasso, which is um, an AI model, to develop models that are responsible, where revenue generated will provide royalties to content creators. So this is already a step in the right direction, but it's a small step. And in order to create a big, effective step, it needs to be done by legislation. And also, similarly, another example of what it would look like is the music industry. Using the music industry as a blueprint is an important example because it looked like musicians weren't going to be incentivized to create music. All of this illegal file sharing, all of this reproduction of it, this lack of profits that they were getting for their work was come to an end once there was legislation created. And that legislation allowed for the music industry to prosper as AI and art can prosper if we create the proper regulations and the proper legislations. Thank you. Thank you everyone for participating and for asking questions. Now we will move on to the final segment of this event. Before we do that, debaters, please find a seat. I am so honored to bring up our distinguished guest judge, Dr. Mark Long, the Dean of the UCR School of Public Policy to give remarks, pick the winner of tonight's debate, and provide feedback to our student debaters. Dean, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank, thank the presenters, uh, Rachel and Cooper. It was a fantastic debate, and I really appreciate them very for it. And I also want to thank you as an audience for coming. Uh, this is a really interesting area that has not had a lot of discussion, and so I think it's, it's a good time for that kind of discussion. Um, I'm kind of in a unique position to have this conversation. Um, some of you may know this, some of you may not, but I was an undergraduate studio art major, um, and uh, after college I worked in an art gallery in Los Angeles for four years um, selling art. Um, I was also almost a philosophy major, which, which strangely has some connections because there's lots of issues about um, the existence of the self and creativity and the mind and consciousness. Um, but now I uh, work in public policy and I'm also dabbling in writing a book on machine learning uh, and prediction problems, of which in some ways what AI and art is doing is a prediction problem. In this case, it's instead of uh, predicting whether someone's going to drop out of high school or predicting where and when a crime is going to happen, it's predicting what kind of image will be um, liked by the viewer, what kind of image will be consistent with the prompt that the user is given. Um, and so it's, it's fundamentally a prediction problem, which, which I find really interesting. So for all those reasons, I'm interested in this question. Um, one of the things coming into this debate, and, I, and I'll just admit I, um, I was biased towards Cooper's side of the debate to begin with, um, so Rachel kind of had a high, high burden, um, because <laughs> for the following reason, is that I am skeptical about the extent to which what AI is doing is all that distinct from what our own human minds do. That we as artists, we take in all the visual stimuli we've seen, we see existing arts, existing creative imagery, and we then go on and create new art inspired by that existing art. One of the things that, um, when I was working at the art gallery, one of the artists we had was Blake Edwards. You, you might know Blake Edwards from um, the Pink Panthers movies. He was a director, but he also had a side career as an artist, as a painter, and a sculptor. And we had some challenge selling his work, and, and particularly the sculpture. And part of that was because the sculptures he was doing were so similar to a more uh, famous uh, sculptor, Henry Moore. And so if you go back and look at the collection, it's not that distinct. And so in some ways, the market self-regulates, because if it's not a newly created, distinct piece of art, it's not going to sell. 
Um, of course, there is the challenge that AI can sort of rip off an, an existing piece of art, and, um, and this is some of the some of the issues that Rachel um, raised. Um, so, as I mentioned, Rachel had a high burden for me. That said, I'm also a strong believer in property rights. I think the existence of such rights gives incentives for creators to create. And if we don't have those strong property rights, in this case copyright, we will lessen those incentives. Then that um, essentially gave an opportunity um, for Rachel. Uh, I'm going to say that I, I, I wasn't, I, my mind wasn't changed. And for that reason, I'm going to say Cooper won the debate, but I think Rachel made strong arguments. So I'll just give that as my conclusion, but let me explain why. Uh, so the first thing that I think is key here is, and, and Rachel's presentation was picking up on this, was the existence of fair use regulation. Of course, that raised the question for me, since we already have it, why do we need new law? And also, the discussion of the Warhol uh, Prince photo case also suggests to me that there's an existing mechanism for regulating whether some existing piece of art is sufficiently distinct from old art, and that makes me skeptical that we need something uh, new. Rachel mentioned it's not permissible under fair use to lower the value of the original work. Of course, there are strong limitations um, on the extent to which this is true. Uh, by the way, just parenthetically, this is a big issue right now in the writer's strike, which is currently in day 32. The writer's three goals are more money, more job security, and limiting AI, because what they're worried about is AI using existing scripts and creating new scripts from it. Um, but that said, economic destruction is not a good argument, I don't believe, for regulation per se. If we thought that way, then we would have never had the Industrial Revolution, because we would have said that, that was going to cause mass reductions in farming, for example. Um, so, um, and it's also the case that new art it always causes old art to lose value. If you think about the movie industry, for example, we get new movies, and that pushes out the movies that are currently in the theater, right? Because people want to see what's new. Um, those older video titles don't get as much play because people want to see what's new. And so it's always the case that new art has negative effects on old art. And fair use allows that. Um, there was a case um, that popped up in my head as they were presenting that came up a number of years ago. It was, it was a case where Victoria's Secret, the lingerie company, sued a Tennessee lingerie store that was called Victor's Little Secret. And the, the argument there was that it was a trademark infringement, and the courts ultimately sided with Victor's Little Secret in basically concluding that um, co customers would not be confused by the because the names were sufficiently distinct from each other. And so that ultimately is the question, whether the extent of confusion will create a, a loss to the, to the existing artist, not whether new works of art being generated are going to cause reductions in the value of the existing corpus of works. Um, the other thing I want to say, so Rachel brought up some interesting uh, points about um, the ability to recreate existing pieces uh, in the training data set. But the question there for me is, even if we can reproduce the images in the training data set, that's not a problem if access to the training data set image was legally allowable. So if anyone could obtain that piece of imagery to begin with, I don't see that how this is a problem. So as the, the, what Rachel raised as the medical image, that to me suggests a problem, particularly if there was theft involved in the original image and the inclusion of it in the data set, or if there wasn't consent provided for um, having that image in the, in the training data set. Um, so this actually gets to, I think, Rachel's best argument, which is fair use law was um, devised before the ability to draw on billions of images. Uh, I thought that was compelling Compelling in the sense that when we write law, we write law thinking about what's in, in existence at the time, and it may not be as applicable. And interestingly, I thought Cooper actually kind of weakened some of his own argument at the beginning, and I wrote down a couple things because he, he noted um, that we don't want more restrictions on AI, however, however, we might want to allow the evolving of future laws. And then at the end he talked about we may need new guidelines to foster development. So guidelines and evolution of laws to me seems like new regulation. So I, in some ways I thought Cooper was um, allowing for the point that because it's new we may need to rethink what we're doing. 
Uh, finally, I'll just wrap up with a couple things here. Um, so I think fundamentally the, 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 the deepest question is here is about the training databases, whether there's permission given for a particular image to that data set. I think that's the fundamental issue. And so if I have copyright protection, like if I was the Prince photographer, I think I'd have a reason to say I do not give permission for this image to be used in, the, in, the, in this data set. Um, and I think at the end, I think we, we have the existing rules to do, we have the existing laws to deal with this because you can ultimately sue and say, no, this is, this is what's being produced is, um, is similar enough to the existing imagery that is causing the loss. But I also think you might have some ability to say, I don't give permission for this to be used in this way because it's, it's my personal property. And I'll stop there. So thank you very much. Thank you again to the, um, to the presenters, and thank you as an audience. Thank you so much, Dean Long, for serving as our guest judge today, and congratulations, Cooper, for winning today's debate. We have now reached the conclusion of today's event. Our sin sincerest thanks again to Dean Long for taking time out of his bu very busy schedule to be with us on this Friday evening. Thank you to the student debaters, Rachel Strassman and Cooper Prue. Special thanks as well to student debate coach, Derek Pedigo. And, <laughs> and thank you to Chief Ambassador Kevin Karami and Vice Chief Ambassador Rayon Kalam for planning this event alongside Director of External Development. And thank you to all our attendees for joining today. We have some boba, so please help yourselves. We hope you'll join us at our next event on June 8th at 1.30 p.m. when California Chief Service Officer Josh Friday, a member of Governor Gavin Newsom's cabinet, will be visiting the School of Public Policy for a reception and to talk about the work of California volunteers in the governor's office. You can learn more about UCR School of Public Policy events like these by visiting our website, spp.ucr.edu. While you're there, you can also learn about our Master of Public Policy program. We're so glad you could be with us this evening. We look forward to seeing you at future UCR School of Public Policy events soon. Until then, goodbye.